Next up is Elena Deraglassi, a writer and professional actress based in New York City, the author of Curtain Speech from Pin and Anvil this year. She has performed in film and television and in off-Broadway and regional theater and will appear this spring in Boston at the world premiere of M at the Huntington. Elena. Uh, my first poem is called Life's a Colander, uh, and it bears an epi epigraph from All's Well That Ends Well. Uh, yet in this captious and intenable sieve, I still pour in the waters of my love, and lack not to lose still. I've recently been thinking of the way All's Well's Helena compares herself to kitchen implements, because sometimes when I look at you, my sternum smarts with an unromantic sledgehammer-like slam, or a pricking like the notching in of nails. If these sensations were not palpable, I'd pick lighter metaphors than tools. But carpentry is the best comparison. Sometimes affection hits us like a pan. And always, it seems, life's a colander. I've repeated this poem's epigraph in dozens of auditions as I kneel and pray in this same way and saying this, and every time a genuine emotion pours through the little holes in O's and E's, the sieve of Shakespeare never filling too. For in the end, I ride the gyroscope of this crazy stage-dependent life because I have a surfeit of myself and must dispense with all of it somehow. This excess abundance is the reigning star of all I do, my too much way of writing, the bodily requirement that I make more than one person from my single form, and the atomic way my rib bomb detonates. So my upcoming book, Curtain Speech, uh, from the Pen and Anvil Press, um, is all about uh, poems about the theater. And I picked a sort of a number of poems about different characters uh, at sort of different points in the process. And uh, my first one is about, um, I'm so used to competing with machinery. Uh, my first one is about when I got the chance to play Mary Shelley, which was like a huge big deal for me and made my whole life make sense because I wrote my thesis on Keats and Shelley. So I was really jazzed as you will see in this poem. <clears throat> Invocation to Mary. When I happen on my face, I mutter, Mary, since now within myself I see her first, or since I wish that I could see her clearly beyond all compounded accolades on earth. Mary, I lay down in my bed like Shelley waiting in the churchyard for a ghost. Although I know that you will ultimately make me more corporeally whole, I still search each scrap of air for errant pieces of your soul, since even more than any other character, their visitations to me a golder shine than gold. I wish you'd bring your benediction down. You make me strain all my superlatives, already grasping as the minutes drown, already terror-hardened that you'll leave. This next one is called Hanging Out. When you and I slounge about in the hot, slick days and the nights starred with mosquitoes, our mouths dribble with curses. Later, fuck, catapults from my lip. Potty mouth, chides my friend, used to me blasting and pooing like a moderately scandalous 19th century girl. <laughs> Hanging out with Jeffrey makes me swear, I explained. He swears as innocently and as often as a lamb drops poop. He's your character, my friend interjects. No, I am his. This next poem, uh, called My Mr. Paradise, is about a, a poem, of, or is about a play, Mr. Paradise, by Tennessee Williams that was in uh, Five by 10 here in Boston at Speakeasy Stage. And in the play, it's about a young poet um, coming to sort of like track down this uh, poet whose volume she found and loves. O oh, father poet who has stayed at sight's periphery with a face as tragic as a bird, forgive my inattention and do not make me old before my time. O oh, loosen me of coldness in this world where to be trodden 
is the best accessory. I am tired of this age where you fashion cynicism in its eyes until I wish that I could compensate by keeping green the stalks that have been bent. Already I'm aware of those half-truths endurance sells us in exchange for days, love and art's expectations crashing, that knowledge is fair payment for potential that we lose in getting it, that someday the world will grow more ceremonious and all lost beauty that I have fought to save will be picked up by one or two and turned in their fingers like an ancient coin. Uh, this next poem, Lady Percy and I Attend a Dress Rehearsal, is about um, uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One, for all of you keeping score at home, um, or for any Falstaff fans out there. I watched him enter, blood-headed, arms ending in a sword, and thunderbolt against the Prince of Wales. No Lady Percy ever had to see his blade get knocked away, the messy fist and elbow struggle cut off by the double stroke, coating the sword with his insides, the first stab that starts to incapacitate, the second his guts hugging for a moment, the steel of Monmouth's sword, which then removed, takes the same way all other losses take. This way comes the riddle of our doubling. Hotspur's real Elizabeth and William Shakespeare's Kate never saw their husbands lose their lower legs and kneel, who would himself have been enthroned upon that Rome, now coating his knee bones with the battlefield, crawling, saying suddenly he could prophesy who denounced the Welsh man's augury, while I, never married to the man I watched, was rattled violently by my shoulders in the theater swamp of seats, coating my nose and cheeks with tears, feeling as if I were transmitting the sight of his lifeless body into Kate's universal mind and being the tear ducts for her, since hers are incorporeal, or else rotted long before John and Mary Shakespeare welcomed out their son, the Smith of English, crammed with his myriad humanities, the same bloody, bawling way all are welcomed out. Lady Percy, bound onto the wheel of loss, continually supplicating her husband not to go, continually losing the battle as he leaves, wrestling him in Wales and after the great gulf that subdivides the story, showing up as briefly, left continually with nothing but her bravery. I'm glad I'm not so fettered to that wheel, whose forend is always falling to the dirt. But for several years, it seems, I too am continually losing, sometimes without possessing much to start, continually left with just that same invisible companion of my courage. Which is worse, that like the mountain-bound Prometheus, the organ of your love regrows to be continually plucked out each time it dies, or that I should lose all out of a coat of holes sewn together by a needle with no thread, lose even your loss in the maze of space, and in the barricades of weeks eventually lose the rinds and fruit until the stones of this emotion only rattle, dwindle, and leave me finally like a reed taken from a lake. Suffice that I supplicated, lost and now I weep for your husband, cradled in stage blood. As usual, I possess no answer to the paradox of doubling, which of us is marching in whose coats. Uh, this poem, entitled For Mary, Departed, is not about Mary Shelley, it's about a different Mary in a different play. You and I have been so close, you sometimes were invisible, and I wonder now that you too are gone into the rain-specked grass, if I took you for granted, the way we take ourselves for granted, that first assumption, each day the eyelids keep opening after sleep, I wonder, did I fail to love you enough, mostly loving him you loved, or was this finally the service all characters deserve? Maybe the way I miss you is the same way I will miss my body the day after I've misplaced it. 
that joy of joint and muscle, of radiance and sprout. Uh, my last poem is called Peter Church. One, death of my child who shares my body comes. Autumn is a petticoat beneath the skirts of August. Oh, God in life and life in God, like a trinity identical, whose name is pure semantics, who is worshipped where the fiber end of love springs its hair-like root, who is worshipped with a book or worshipped with teeth flaring at the sky. Against the simper of the sideways lioness eating unborn children in the black age of her mouth, I will make my fingers to a lance, my veins into pins, and lead my eyes and ribcage like tilled soil, like the water's stretch of surface tension. Forge this body from its own melted mold. This is the life upon the lines, the hardest stone to set to, being soft. Three. I take this, death inside a day's membrane, a fan of lies within duration of a soul mortality. I take this where the hour hand is fatal, where the evening line calls in the doves and fire. Praise those fictions, but also praise the chase that bleeds challenge on reality. I build my time like a hut of sticks on the shore of a hurricane delta. Oh my God, never give me ease.